I have to correct it. I was looking here, and I, you know, I, when you get older, you kind of know when the time frame is. But it says this picture was taken in Sydney uh, on the 11th of May, 2011. So it wasn't 2014. Time flies when you're having fun, <laughs> especially when you're 78 years old. You know. But uh, on this trip, there was uh, 36 people on this trip. It was a land trip. 25 were women and 11 guys. Now, I learned a lot, and I'll kind of explain that, but I'll pass this around. If you'd like to look at it, I'll just read it up. Okay, first of all, I'd like to, to thank uh, uh, Teresa, and I'd like to thank the friends of uh, learning inviting me to share uh, our 22 uh, day experience with uh, 34 other travelers over age 55 and I think is there anybody under age 55 here <laughs> so, hey, <laughs> that's a good idea. Okay. and we visited uh, as she mentioned Australia uh, New Zealand and Fiji and in May it's it's down under, it's opposite here, it was in the fall. And what, by the way, both Rochelle and I are ISU alumni. Um, I was the IBM field engineer responsible to maintain the mainframe at ISU from 1966 to 1976. And including the great flood, uh, the ISU computer center flooded. Uh, the mainframe and the other computers had this much water. Ooh. <laughs> and uh, the sewer had backed up. It's a basement. It's the uh, administration. So I was responsible to make sure or try to bring that computer back to life. And I did. And uh, it was amazing. Uh, IBM makes incredible equipment at that time. And, uh, and they gave me an, an attaboy. <laughs> for that. But yeah, it, uh, it was an uh, incredible experience. Compressing the 22 days that we traveled in one hour is quite a chore and ch challenge for me because I took 4,500 pictures. You guys don't take pictures when you travel, do you? <laughs> okay. So I decided on three different uh, topics with a few pictures. Uh, number one is why I have an itch to travel. You know, it started when I was little. And a lot of you probably hear the same way. You get the itch to do it. And I'll kind of go over that and explain how that happened, especially to travel overseas. And number two, the Boston, Massachusetts Grand Circle Tour Company, they've been around for 65 years. A great company. And uh, we tried it on our, uh, by ourselves. Uh, we went, uh, we have a timeshare in Maui, Hawaii, and we swapped it for a timeshare in, in Austria, in Spanish, in Austria. And we couldn't see things. We, you know, we'd always miss the tours or miss the schedules. and. You know, like the sound of music in the, the Abbey there. It was, you know, it didn't, you know, there was more free time that we were trying to run down things. With this travel group, it's all regimented. So you get to see a lot. The other nice thing about it is if you decide to stay afterwards, okay, for a month, you can stay. And then your plane ticket is good that you paid for in the price, and it's about 300 bucks a day. And you can come back when you want to. A lot of a lot of travelers do that. I can't say enough about the company, and they're not as big as Viking, but they are a, um, a family-owned business. And I don't know how many people they have, but I get a ton of mail wanting me to go on other trips. Do you remember the company name? Grand Circle uh, Tours. You can look at online. It's golfcharliechango.com. I'm I'm a ham radio guy too. In military. Uh, GolfCharlieTango.com, and I'll show you the video uh, that I that I took. All these pictures that I have, they're not going to be great quality because I had to figure out how to do it, and so I took pictures with another camera and then loaded it. Okay, so all most of these uh, pictures, except for one, are all uh, things that I just picked out uh, off the internet with another camera. We're going to talk about the graduated minimum wage, the McDonald's Big Mac index. I'll explain that. Uh, Australia, Medicare for all. And then uh, I met a guy in, uh, in, uh, when we were traveling through Switzerland on a train. He was, he was of Indian descent, and him and his uh, wife and his child. And I had mentioned about 
how we, we have Medicare. He says, oh, we had Medicare too. Oh, okay, well, you don't look like you're old enough. <laughs> uh, no, I says, in America, you can only get Medicare when you're 65. And he said, no, this is for me and my family. And he showed me a card. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll show that picture to you. They have Medicare for all. Not to be confused, and here in this country, of course, you know what our situation is. Uh, and the other, the last thing is uh, compulsory, compulsory voting. You gotta vote, and I'll go over how that happened. Uh, since 1924, the turnout is 94%. Uh, and if you don't vote, and you gotta go in when it's time to vote, and they have to mark your name off of the roll, and if you don't, they send you a, a notice that you owe them 25 bucks. Okay. And when we were on the tour, the bus driver was complaining, yeah, they nailed me for 150 bucks. Because you know? he was, you know, he, he just, his job was uh, traveling away and uh, with, uh, with all of his travelers. So, and it works for them. I have a timer to keep me on track and I'm talking into it now. And uh, a friend of mine, and I don't see him, but anyway, he called me up and he says, Mike, don't ramble. <laughs> and, I, and, and he knows me, so I promise I'll try not to do that. And here we go. There it is. Okay, so as you can see here, uh, I had this on the wall. This is the Mark Twain, and it kind of reminds myself of why I travel a lot. It's, and it's, it's true. You know, I met people who have never traveled outside of Idaho. They haven't even traveled off the farm yet, okay? And sometimes their opinions especially are, are based on I heard, not I've been. And so Mark Twain is absolutely correct. Travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness, and many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. <laughs> it's true, and I think maybe I'm talking to the choir here. But uh, it's absolutely true. Um, I have uh, been at uh, various sessions. You know, I've met people and I see the children and, and they're here in Idaho and I start talking about some of the adventures, I call them that, uh, and their eyes light up. <clears throat> And maybe I planted a little seed, but there's a lot of uh, a lot of folks that uh, just don't. They think there's they think there's a moat around Idaho. <laughs> the Idaho way, whatever the heck that is, right? And uh, having grown here, I I just uh, just say that uh, when uh, the uh, you know. Uh, when I was born in Pocatello, raised in Pocatello, uh, my parents got a divorce when I was 18 months old. They were young, and I lived with my grandmother, and I was bounced around uh, a foster parents out in Grace, Idaho. Never really had any stability for the first nine years. My dad eventually, you know, he was there, he was single, eventually he joined the Air Force, enlisted, and went to Korea, and then by the same, at the same time, he was looking for somebody to take on this uh, blonde-haired, blue-eyed kid that had ants in his pants. <laughs> yeah, I did, really. Eventually, he, he married a gal, she's all taken on, so moved to Illinois. Uh, Dad was stationed at Scott Air Force Base. I mentioned I caught polio while I was there. Th welcome to Illinois. <laughs> I was there three weeks and caught polio. But uh, I survived. <clears throat> but during that time, you know, you're around military personnel all the time. And dad, dad would go on temporary assignments to, to exotic places like China uh, to help the uh, uh, Formosa at that time to help the U-2 spy planes fly over China to take and Russia to take pictures in July of 1956, four years before the U-2 was shot down. But anyway, he did, couldn't tell us where he went, but, but still we had an atmosphere. We, uh, when you're around military bases, everybody's moving. And so <clears throat> got kind of that. And then in, uh, living in Illinois, and then going to six different schools, different, six, moving, living in six different communities, and going to six different community, uh, school systems. The one that really got me is the 19th, when, I, when he was transferred to Augusta, Georgia, in the mid-50s. 
And here I am, the Pocatello kid. And I experienced uh, segregation. And, you know, the, the uh, men, women, and colored uh, bathrooms uh, at a gas station, men, women, and in the back. Uh, water fountains, uh, water, colored. Uh, I was almost kicked off the back of a bus because uh, I sat down in the middle of a bus in my Army ROTC high school uniform, junior ROTC, and the guy said, and he pulled off the side, he made her get up and the 65 year old lady get up and go to the back of the bus and he told me, he said, you ever do that again? On my bus, I'll kick you off. And this was real. And then I was, uh, uh, they asked me because I was in ROTC, I, I was uh, hired by the Masters Golf Tournament that's a dumb game. <laughs> when you're 17 years old, in 1960, uh, um, Arnold Palmer uh, won it, and I watched him, and he had his army and everything. Uh, I saw Bing Crosby there. He didn't have any hair. <laughs> you know, he had lots of freckles. But it was quite an experience, and some of the old film, you'll see me, they tried to rope on me because I was tall and weighed 140 pounds. And, uh, and we'd run out in the middle of the fairway and make an opening and, and somebody pushed and Sam Sneed put a hole right in the, a spike right into my spit shine shoe. And that was kind of an experience. <coughs> they were a bunch of cheesecakes that only paid seven bucks, two dollars a day and they gave you a cheese sandwich. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the next year it was uh, Gary Player came in from Africa. But I learned a little bit, but boy, I want to tell you something. Uh, I didn't understand the game, and, and now that I'm retired, I still don't understand the game. <laughs> okay. So, how did I get to it? And later on, we went to Panama. He was transferred in Panama. I learned, uh, uh, we lived in Panama City. I was running around with, uh, uh, my dad thought incorrigibles. One of them was, a, his dad was the richest, uh, one of the third richest uh, uh, men in uh, Panama and he explained the political system. There are three different families that, that swapped uh, the presidency at that time. And my dad, uh, <laughs> it was a, quite an experience, but I came home too many times with rum and coke on my breath. And, and then when I graduated from high school, he called me in and he says, uh, now that you're a man, what are you gonna do? And I said, well, dad, I like to go to college. And my dad said, well, not so fast. <laughs> I'm gonna give you two choices. Okay, what are the choices? He said, uh, I'll give you uh, $100 and an airplane ticket to the United States and good luck. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not even shaving yet, right? <laughs> and I said, well, what's the other choice? He says, go down and see the recruiter, don't care which one. <laughs> okay, dad. <laughs> my dad was a sergeant. I mean, he was the sergeant. And uh, I said, well, how long do I have to make up my mind? Oh, 10, 15 minutes ought to do it. <laughs> so anyway, I took the test, but he was absolutely correct. Uh, he was worried that I would be running around. Uh, in fact, one of, the, one of the guys I was running around with, he says, if you become a Panamanian citizen, I'll make you a millionaire at age 25. And I thought, ah, come on. But it turned out his dad was a multimillionaire. But uh, anyway, it's a... So one of the things, I went to Lackland Air Force Base and then got trained on the F-105 Thud. It's a fighter bomber that was uh, used primarily uh, for uh, uh, delivering atomic bombs on the, uh, on the Soviet Union. And they sent me to Spangdahlem, Germany. Well, while I was in Spangdahlem, Germany, they said, wow, you know, you know, when you're rooming with 100 guys, no phone calls, no email, no trips home because you can't afford it and you have to live there for 36 months, and you have to get along. And during that process, you know, I said, well, I'm not gonna stay around here because I had 90 days of leave. And as a result, uh, I, uh, uh, I traveled. And the kind of travel I had was I'd ask somebody to go with me. If they didn't go with me, I'd grab my a GI blanket and a pillow and off I'd go. And sometimes I'd be sleeping in the car and other, other times not. Uh, gasoline was 25 cents a gallon, and that 56 uh, Volkswagen had a 64 engine in it. <laughs> so anyway, it, uh, it was a, a great way to see things. But I, I went to 18 countries. And when you do that, you know, you, you go to the, I mean, you, you do, and you can't speak the language, but, uh, you know, that's part of it. 
And I learned so much because it was not so much of just seeing things. You know, I drove around the, uh, the Vatican. I didn't know that. We, we picked up a couple of girls from uh, exchange students from Pennsylvania. We heard them talking, and, you know, when you're a couple of GIs and you hear English and you're in, you know, Austria, <laughs> you kind of stood out. And we asked them to go with us in the Volkswagen because I was traveling, it was the last thing I did. And then we, we grouped together in the Volkswagen and then uh, went all the way from uh, uh, Vienna uh, into the Swiss Alps and the Italian Alps, uh, rode in a, uh, a gondola for a thousand lira with them, uh, stayed at a place that was $5 uh, uh, to stay. Anyway, eventually, and I'll finish up with this story, is that early in the morning on a Saturday, on a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning, I think it was Sunday morning, we were looking for the Bonhoff, or the train station, and I call it Bonhoff, not whatever it was in Italian. And we drove in and there was this, this big circle. Uh, it was a, like a plaza. And we drove around the circle and we looked over and there was a, this guy with a spear and he had black and orange pajamas on. I had no idea where we were. You know, I had a USA plate. We were in the Vatican, driving around, and there was no, you know, there was no barriers or anything. Okay. Well, one of the things, too, my, uh, my friend over here, uh, Vance, we were ham radio operators, and that was another thing. When I was, uh, I, I started listening to shortwave. I started listening to Radio Moscow. Uh, learned the Morse code. And that was an opening. I realized also that there's a big world out there. And, and they, especially learning about the cultures. And that was another thing that probably instilled me to, to do some things. And I'll just go through quickly some of the things that did this without uh, hanging around here on this one. And, and, uh, the, and the other thing, of course, I, I, I'm sure you've seen this. You ever seen these things on when you went to the movies? Yes. Okay. Well, we watch them on TCM all the time, and that that was another thing. This was back in the back when we were in school. They had them in the, in the movie theaters. That was when movies cost fifteen cents. Uh, yeah, cheap theater, right? On on Saturday. Yeah. Yeah, the popcorn nickel. Right. Mm. And then one of the things that, uh, that, uh, that happened along the way was um, I built a ham radio. And when I, when I did that, um, that opened the door for me to talk to the world. And, and I listened to, and I built a radio in Radio Australia. I'll see if I can find that. This, this kind of thing you can listen to, you know, I tune into Radio Australia and um, down under, and I listen to Radio Moscow, I listen to Radio Havana, Cuba, the communist radio stations, but also AFRTS that had ABC, NBC, CBS. And, and that kind of perked up things. In other words, it told me that there's different places. And of course those, yeah, but you also Radio Luxembourg and Radio Japan and there was thousands of these uh, shortwave stations at that time, and that also helped me do things. And I'm trying to find that one. Here we go. So I got the, I, I built my first transmitter that allowed me to do this, to talk around the world myself. And my dad knew something was up, you know, because I built a crystal set out of a block of wood, and and when I was about, I don't know, 10, 12, and we went to a TV uh, repair shop and bought a 1N34 germanium diode, and it cost a dollar. Well, my allowance was 50 cents a week. And my dad said, why are you spending two weeks of your allowance for this? <laughs> so he knew something, but anyway, I built a transmitter like that. You'll have to forgive me for this. Uh, I, I didn't know what else to expect. <clears throat> on this and one of the things you have to do is another thing is I had to learn this too I mean, if you're an engineer all this but but that allowed me to talk and one of the exciting things is I built this transmitter and I uh, and I got on with my Morse key code and I said uh, I called the CQ a general and a guy came back 
Normally the range on the shortwave was about 800 miles, or maybe in the nights you could do 1,000. He was in Libya, North Africa. Now when you're a kid, and you're talking to a guy that's at Wheelis Air Force Base in Libya, North Africa, I want to tell you, I didn't study but very much after that. I stayed up late uh, trying to do it again. It was a fluke in condition. So the amateur radio opened up a lot of doors to me too. All right. Um, and then uh, in, uh, in 1963, uh, <clears throat> immediately got there. A guy at the base, uh, he had a brand new car. He says, let's go to Paris. And so we did. We left on Friday. We got back. Uh, and we spent the weekend there. I went on the Eiffel Tower. I went on the top of the Champs Elysees. I went to Pig Isle, and I went to the Lido. Uh, okay, how many have been to the Lido? Okay, <laughs> you know, the Lido is a topless uh, uh, show like Las Vegas, and that's the first time I'd ever seen anything like that, and that was in 1963. <laughs> I mean, come on, I never, I know, and it, it was really kind of an eye-opener. They, <laughs> they, they had a horse run, it was a Turkish bath. So, and, and, uh, so the, the other thing, uh, you know, this, I know it's going to show this. Uh, this is another requirement, and this was the key, and this is called, how many know Morse code besides that guy over there? He's my friend, that's Van. Does anybody do Morse code? Okay, to get the license, I had to, I had to uh, copy five um, words per minute, which is about six times five is 30, word, 30 dots and dashes in 60 seconds. I've advanced a little bit over the years. I won this in Boise, and I was the first place, uh, top of the heap. Uh, I competed against 12 people, and I won it at uh, 45 words a minute. That's uh, 1,018 dots and dashes in 60 seconds. Don't ask me how I do it. Uh, my wife here of 54 years, Rochelle, she says I'm a ding -a so I think that's probably, <laughs> probably appropriate. Folks, how are we doing on time? All right, <clears throat> I'm gonna move right along into uh, what you're here for to learn about Australia. But I think you can tell that there's a lot of things that happened, a lot of these different things I haven't talked about, and a lot of, a lot of things happened that encouraged me to travel and, and, and generated the curiosity. And sometimes you, you, what you learn is you don't want to go to some places like in Copenhagen where you go down to the wharf and these guys are sitting there and they've got these pea coats on these hats and you look at them they're looking at you kind of funny. And I said, I better get out of here because I think they're going to take me to Shanghai. <laughs> so, so, but you know, you're by yourself, but you're doing it. It's not chaperone. You understand? All these trips were not chaperone. They had the freedom of doing it. Uh, just, you know, it's my, my, my judgment call. And, and, and it's different than when you're, for example, you know, as you probably know, uh, a lot of guys said they've been to China. And I said, well, what'd you do? Well, I went and did business and I walked around the hotel. <laughs> okay. Same thing with Japan and other places. And, uh, and, they, and they think they've seen it. Well, you don't. And that's the nice thing about this tours that we have through this, through this company is that it's, it's uh, culture. You learn about the culture. You go to a family's house. You sit down and, and she prepares a meal for them in China or Australia or New Zealand. And I'll cover that in a short video here. So let me get to, to the point that I want to get to. Oh, and by the way, <clears throat> while I was in... Uh, Germany, I worked for Armed Forces Television. Uh, I, how many here have been in the military? Are you familiar with AFM? Sure. Well, in 1963, uh, there was 30 TV stations in the 150 station uh, AF, AFM network around the world. I just happened to have one at Spangdala. They needed somebody on the weekends, and so they hired me. And by golly, when I went in the Air Force, I was making 72 bucks a month. <laughs> okay, and and I think when I when they asked me to go to work for them, I was making 120 or something, but by golly, they paid me 90 cents an hour. <laughs> and it was a lot of fun, and I and I learned everything. But I was there. I learned a lot in that experience. Uh, you know, I got to meet Baron Young, Vicky Carr, uh, George Goebel. You know, some of these famous names on U.S. Uh, U.S.O. tours. Got to learn to run the camera. And I did that for 28 months out of my uh, 
a 36 month tour. I had my regular Monday through Friday job down at the, on the line on the F-105 aircraft, loaded with 20 kiloton, you know, that's another story. And then on the weekends I'd work at AFRTS. <clears throat> but they also, I also had 90 days of leave and they'd give me the time off. Evidently the station manager made an agreement with my squadron commander so that I would be available on weekends. Working at a TV station, and my friend over here, he says an engineer, that got a KID, working at a TV station and doing that and all the people you meet is fun, that's not work. And I tried to get on a KID here and the rest of it, but IBM was, they'd only pay me 300 bucks when I got out of the service in a radio station spinning records, but IBM was offering 450. <laughs> and then she called me up for a blind date. <laughs> she said, I know your mother. When I asked her, who are you? I know your mother. And, then, and I said, well, what do you look like? Well, you'll have to take your chances. <laughs> well, I did. And, her, and she knew how to control me because her dad was an Iwo Jima Marine. Okay? So a lot, and, and also a Korean veteran. So, so anyway, uh, we're, we're okay, correct? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let me get to the, the Australian part so I don't bore you with anything else that I have here. We're right on time. I think I'm keeping the, okay, I need this. And this is, uh, this was the trip we took. And actually this one is, uh, we actually went into Brisbane. But uh, you can see that at that time in 2011, it was, it was uh, $3,000 for the whole thing. And, and, but that didn't include airfare. And then uh, there was an extension to the Fiji Islands uh, for five days, so a total of 20, 22 days. But for 300 bucks, you know, I couldn't see any, you know, and, and, the, and the other thing is there's a, kind of a loyalty factor that they have. And for example, if you guys want to go on a trip and you tell them that you talked to me and I recommended them, you get a $100 discount. <laughs> and I get a $100 discount. <laughs> but I don't work for them. But they're a great company. Can you see it okay? Okay, but you can see uh, uh, we were actually supposed to go to Christchurch, and uh, they had the earthquake at that time, so they rerouted us to uh, the uh, Rotorua, and evidently that worked out very well. Has anybody ever been to Rotorua? It's like it's, have you? Anybody? It's like uh, Yellowstone Park. You've been there? Yeah, you know, right? Well, the, the, the manholes that are boiling water, and you take and stick meat in there and cook it. So yeah, it's a, it was quite an experience. So I'm just gonna go right to uh, the, uh, the uh, only film I have, and supposedly this will work. And I just took it from a, a picture of... Uh <laughs> From the vivid colors of the Great Barrier Reef to the shining architecture of Sydney's Opera House, Australia is a world of wonders. While New Zealand fascinates travelers with its pristine fjords, alpine vistas, and rich Maori heritage. With Grand Circle, you can experience the amazing diversity of these two countries on a single comprehensive journey. you'll truly immerse yourself in local culture as you explore this region in depth. You'll see a side of the people and a way of life that you might not see with other travel companies. And you'll learn the personal history of your destination through encounters with local people. With a rich itinerary and so much included, it's easy to see what makes this both a great trip and a great value. You can improve your value and create your own unique travel experience when you personalize your trip. Visit Multicultural Melbourne and view Mystical Ayers Rock in the heart of the outback. Five days, Discover the tropical paradise of Fiji, which offers the ultimate escape from the everyday. Keep watching to learn more about these extensions later on. From your hometown, You'll set out on a journey of discovery. Fly overnight to Sydney and on to Cairns, where you'll meet your program director and begin your journey across Australia and New Zealand. Discover the Great Barrier Reef and the wildlife of Australia's tropical north. 
Learn more about Aboriginal culture in Cairns. Then embark for Sydney, where you'll have ample time to explore Australia's largest and oldest city. From here, it's on to New Zealand. Experience Te Anau, the resort town of Queenstown, and scenic Milford Sound. Then continue on to New Zealand's North Island and explore Rotorua, known for its natural thermal ponds and Maori culture. On this journey, you'll delve into the history and culture of the South Pacific. For example, you can experience the Great Barrier Reef on a glass bottom boat tour, where you'll behold the underwater world of beautiful coral cay and colorful tropical fish. In Queenstown, on New Zealand's South Island, behold spectacular views as you cross Lake Wakatipu aboard a historic steamship. And in the North Island city of Rotorua, you'll gain an understanding of Maori native culture during a visit to a local Maori village. And of course, snorkeling at the Barrier Reef is, you know, just a, some, an unbelievable thrill. All the beautiful fish and the coral, and it's just uh, astounding how great it is. Your land tour will feature unique educational and social activities that add to your discoveries. In Queenstown, you'll learn about life on a local New Zealand sheep farm. You'll also experience Maori culture in depth during a visit to a traditional village, tour Sydney's iconic opera house, and enjoy dinner in the home of a local family. And enjoy close-up encounters with native wildlife at Hartley's Crocodile and Wildlife Park in Cairns. You'll see koalas, hand-feed kangaroos in a private enclosure, and watch crocs at feeding time. It's moments like these that set Grand Circle apart from companies that only show you monuments and overlook the local culture. I'm an animal lover and I could not wait to get near a koala. So I was so anxious to, to see or hold a koala. Since all our program directors live in the region they serve, they offer a wealth of authentic insight into daily life. They'll give you the backstory on all the places you visit on your vacation and delight you along the way with their personal attention and warm ways. I think travel makes you very open-minded. Uh, you, you see so many different cultures. Um, and I think uh, part, I, part, what I can bring to the tour, to our travellers, is the sense of expanding their horizons a little bit, going out there and doing things that they don't normally do. And Grand Circle really pushes people to go out there and do things they don't normally do. And uh, even if it's just uh, you know swimming on the Barrier Reef or whatever it is, it's just getting out there and doing something different. While in the South Pacific, you'll dine on freshly prepared, regionally inspired meals. Your program director will give you insight on personal favorites and local specialties. As you travel, you'll enjoy the camaraderie of your fellow travelers as you dine in a variety of settings, including local cafes and restaurants. Tonight, we're going to a home-hosted dinner, and uh, we visit a person, a local person's home. We have dinner with them, meet their families, experience their lifestyle, and eat the uh, local food, and learn about their life here firsthand, and that's really fun. Your accommodations have been carefully chosen to offer convenient access to historic landmarks, as well as restaurants and shops. In each hotel, enjoy a full complement of modern amenities, a restaurant and bar for socializing, and an inviting room with private bath. You can experience even more with optional tours. Discover Sydney by night during a dinner in the historic Rocks District. Followed by a water taxi ride across the moonlit harbor That's to fun. Sydney Aquarium. <laughs> and delve even deeper into Maori traditions during a lively dinner and cultural demonstration. Make your trip even more special with our personalization options. From choosing a preferred departure city, to upgrading your seat for extra comfort, and more. 
Experience more of Australia's contrasts in Melbourne and the outback. You'll be immersed in Australia's fusion of cultures in Melbourne. Then venture into the outback, where you'll explore the town of Alice Springs and enjoy a sunset champagne toast at Uluru, also known as Ayers Rock. And add another stamp to your passport with a trip to the island paradise of Fiji, where you'll bask in warm breezes and sunny smiles. Here you'll experience the easy pace of island living with a visit to a village. Learn more about local marine life. That picture with the uh, kids, I'll start it up again. That picture with the kids, I gotta kinda, uh, and I'll segue into this thing. When we went to the Fiji Islands, we, you know, that was part of the, part of the, the uh, post trip of five days. And that's the other thing is that they had these post and pre trips. The one we chose was the, the Fiji Islands. We had no idea. We stayed at the Shangri-La Hotel. And it was a ritzy hotel. And I mentioned the, the Australian beer and, and we'd get up in the morning, it was so good that uh, then we noticed we were putting on some weight. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, just to get into the, the, the part of, of Fiji, is that uh, the, uh, when we got on there, we found out that, and this is what you learn in the culture, how many uh, know that half of Fiji is uh, Indian, 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 and half is the Fijians. Okay, we, we, that's what you uh, know. Uh, we also found out that they had a coup. <laughs> it was a peaceful coup. Uh, the, the Fijians, um, what they did was, uh, uh, the, there was enough political power that the Indians took over. And the Fijians said, now wait a minute, this is our island, you guys are, you know, immigrants. And so they said, we want our country back. And they took it back. Okay. And everybody's happy because, uh, you know, there's a lot of businesses they work together very well and they go to school together. But we went to, uh, and part of, the, part of the foundation, and I looked at those kids and, and we, we went to this kit and, and see what uh, the foundation, this, this group does is they, they donate money. I think there's something like 65 or 70 million dollars over the years. Part of your money on the tour goes to these various foundations. And in this particular case, it was a school. And we were, those kids were enthusiastic. They were grabbing our hands and sending us down and they wanted our email address. <laughs> Don't give them your email address. And they sang songs, but it was a delight. And, uh, and so that's kind of the cultural thing. By the way, we experienced the same thing in China. Uh, and I'm, I'm just gonna I have a talk coming up in China. But in China, uh, we went to a school. It was a fourth grade school. Uh, in Shanghai, I think, part of the foundation, all the kids let us in, held our hand. There was 28 of us. They sat us down in the in the uh, in the school chair, and it looked like something from 1950. You know, I mean, uh, you know, they had the crew, whatever. It was it was an old old thing. The carvings on the desk, and all of a sudden, <clears throat> we realized that they knew what we were saying. I said, "How do they know what we're saying?" And they sang the Yellow Rose of Texas to us. <laughs> and other things but they and they would practice their their speaking and hi my name is Sally what's yours you know the phrases and it turned out and what we learned was is that in China they teach English and Mandarin to the elementary kids even preschool because my nephew did that okay mm -hmm. well you know that was an eye-opener I didn't realize that and then I started to think about it is 75 percent of all the technical material in the world is written in English. Well, you wonder why they're doing all these gadgets and all these things that you, you get online, they're really cheap things. It's incredible. So <clears throat> it's not that you know you hear, well, they're gonna take over the country. No, they're not, China's competitive. But anyway, the point is that this is some, some of the experiences, and I, when I saw those kids, uh, it was delightful. We didn't give them our email address. <laughs> so I have a video. Monument is that said 
We went across that bridge, and that's the hotel we stayed at. Even more. More. And delve even deeper into Maori traditions during a lively dinner and cultural demonstration. Where you'll bask in warm breezes and sunny smiles. Here you'll experience the easy pace of island living with a visit to a village. Learn more about local marine life during a visit to Echo Park and more. You'll also feel good knowing that an annually determined amount of the proceeds from our trips is donated to Grand Circle Foundation. This nonprofit organization gives back to the places we visit by supporting educational programs in the places we travel and preservation efforts like the UNESCO World Monuments Fund. We started the Grand Circle Foundation in 1992 as a way to give something of lasting value back to the world we travel. And to date, we've given millions of dollars to educational, cultural, and conservation projects all around the world. Join us to discover the wondrous variety of the oh, South Pacific. You'll explore fascinating cities and visit pastoral sheep and cattle farms. Behold stunning scenery from the Great Barrier Reef to New Zealand's fjords. Get a close-up view of animals not found anywhere else. And experience the ancient and modern cultures of two very different countries. I'm not a salesman. <laughs> but anyway, grandgct.com, and you can see all these trips. I think they've got 30 of them that uh, you can go on. And here again, the nice thing about it we like is if I wanted to stay in Australia, we could do that for at least a month. And the same plane ticket that we had part of the part of the tour that could be used to fly fly us back home. Okay, now. I want to show you that. By the way, is my, my picture floating around here somewhere? Okay, wherever. That's the group. And this is a, what I was telling you. I looked at that and I said, boy, there's a lot of women in there. You know? <laughs> and there's 25 women and, uh, and uh, 11 guys. There's me right there. And there's Rochelle. Her, her hair is a little bit redder. <laughs> But uh, that was uh, in 2011, and that's the bridge. Um, you know, they had the opportunity to travel over the top of the bridge, or and uh, Rochelle made it across. She's yes. Was the price of the trip then or now? Had then. To... What about the sheet? This sheet I'm going to talk about uh, oh, towards the end. So yeah, it, uh, you can go out online. Actually, everything's gone up, but it's not that bad, you know, in terms of that. Okay, look at that guy right there. Isn't he something else? <laughs> okay. And some of the things that you uh, see is uh, these guys. If, are you, you're familiar with these guys. These are the Amoris in New Zealand. Remember the Buka dance, right? Yeah. And all the tattoos. Let me ask you guys. When my dad, when I indicated I wanted to have a tattoo, he says, if you get a tattoo, you better put it someplace where I can't see it. If you put it where I can see it, I'm gonna hit it. Hmm. Well, anyway, today there's a lot of tattoos. Does anybody know why it's so popular? It used to, in ancient times, it told the family history. I know, but in, in Pocatello, Idaho? <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, that's uh, uh, yeah. I, I. What is the story when when did it switch in Pocatello? What what? When did tattoos become acceptable in Pocatello? I know when I retired. You know, we would go to the Civitan and you know uh, and parks and all this, and I started noticing all these people that had tattoos. Mm -hmm. I see the tattoo parlors. Uh, one of the things, and I'm, this is my opinion, of course, <clears throat> I don't know if you're familiar with hepatitis C. Okay, it's a liver and, and it's, it'll kill you eventually. And about 40% uh, of all the uh, people in, incarcerated have hepatitis C. Mm -hmm. And it's transmitted by blood. And they use piano wires to, to make these tattoos. And we met some youngsters who went into prison 
and they come back with tattoos so that they're macho. But uh, anyway, uh, the cost to treat uh, uh, hepatitis C in India is about 890 bucks. In the United States, it's $1,000 a pill, 84, so it's $84,000. For the same, same uh, medication, it's available in India for 900 bucks. I wonder if there's anybody in this room that has a tattoo. There is well, it's okay to have a tattoo. You didn't have my dad. <laughs> my dad was a bruiser, and he would have hit me. But uh, anyway, and, and of course, there were guys in the Navy, and, and then we'd go down to San Diego, we'd see the guys in the Navy. Usually, they'd be out, you know, partying or whatever with their buddies and get toasted and then go into the tattoo parlor, right? But uh, anyway, I, that was just a question. I thought maybe somebody would know that. All right. Uh, let me get. Uh, when I made this thing, I had to. I didn't exactly know uh, how this was going to go, so you'll have to forgive me. But I will uh, show you this. There we are. See that? <laughs> oh, the jet boat thing. Yeah, we were the. We there was twenty, what twenty, whatever, thirty six, and on the tour, and Rochelle and I. We're the only ones that put our hands up and would do that. The rest of them were chick. Okay, so they dressed up like that, and uh, the kid drove it. Have you ever been on a jet boat? And you, you were, in, were you in? Uh, I, I didn't. That's all over the river. Yeah, it's a, it's in Queenstown. Yeah, I didn't go. On yeah, yeah. See, <laughs> he would he would drive it. Be a guy, this kid, twenty one. He'd drive right by the pillars and turn around and see all this stuff. You know, we had a great time, didn't we? And we survived. <clears throat> the kid was 21 years old. We got to know him. This is just another story. I said, have you ever been in the United States? He says, yeah. I said, I, I went there uh, a year or so ago, and, uh, and I was supposed to be there uh, for uh, a month. I wonder, well, how did you enjoy it? Well, uh, I had to cut it short two weeks. Why is that? Well, I went to Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <laughs> but the, the only point is that uh, there was enough money that this kid could, could uh, make, and that's a segue into graduated minimum wage that I'm going to talk about toward the end of the last segment. How am I doing? Okay, but anyway, it was fun. And we got Nothing wins. like that were included in the price. Uh, no, we had to pay uh, 50 bucks. Yeah, it was an optional thing. Were and, a lot of things optional? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, they said, would you like to go on this? Would you like to do that? Another thing I'd like to share with you, we had a lady that fell down, tripped, and she was in her 60s or 70s. Tell I got black eye. The tour, the tour uh, person took Broke her to the glasses. hospital. Broke her glasses. Huh? Broke her glasses. Broke her glasses. Took her to the hospital. Everything was covered. Okay? By Universal health care. Huh? It was covered by the tour company? No, it was covered by New Zealand. They won't turn you away if you show up. Though. I think that happens in Canada too. Sure, we got a we got a terrible system here. We keep voting for the same guys that make it a terrible system. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, then let's see. Okay, I'm just about here to talk about uh, on the on your on your piece of paper there that you have. I'm going to get into the segue here. Everybody's got one of these? Huh? You didn't have one? Do you have one? Hey, you need some? It's been a while since I've done this. You'll have to forgive me if I'm a little rusty because, you know, I've been retired since 2013. <laughs> I don't have a, a reason to do that. Okay, take a look at your, uh, what we're going to talk about here is the Australia graduated minimum wage. And you've heard, you've heard people say, you know, if we raise the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour, the Big Mac is going to go to 10 bucks, right? Have you heard that? Now, I want to share something. <clears throat> well, one of the things that we do, one of the things I want you to know is that <clears throat> when we went to Russia and it was confirmed, whenever we travel around, we always go to McDonald's. And one of the things McDonald's does, you know, 
One of the things that McDonald's does, they refuse to buy foodstuffs in the country where they reside and do business in their franchises. Hmm. And, how, and how I did that, and then my Russian talk, I'll describe this, because uh, we, we went with a Russian family. <laughs> Russia, and this was in 2012, this is before Crimea. There's no more tours in Russia after, after the sanctions went in, when they went in Crimea. They couldn't afford it because the value of the ruble went from 33 to 72 at all. So it was, they couldn't do it, <coughs> too expensive. But anyway, this guy says, uh, Putin, and the, they said, if you want a franchise like Pizza Hut or Kentucky Fried Chicken or what else, Subway? Taco Bell. Yeah, Taco Bell. He says, you've got to buy all your food ingredients from Mother Russia. Okay? We had a Subway over there. It was awful. Awesome. It didn't taste like the one down the street. <laughs> and, and then, so the guy told me, he said, McDonald's. I was, was told is if you don't buy your stuff in in Russia, your food stuff, you can't have your franchise here. They said, okay. In order to maintain quality, they uh, they insist on it. So when you go any place in the world, China, Japan, sometimes the chicken sandwich is a really a shrimp sandwich. <laughs> but if you go anywhere in those countries, if you eat a Big Mac, it's probably a Texas beef. And if you have French fries, it's probably an Idaho spud. From, from uh, Central. And, and they do that on purpose because they maintain the quality and the taste. Okay, as a result of that, there is a, there's a, uh, an economist magazine that's called the Big Mac Index. And the Big Mac Index is, is where they, they take a look at the price and currency and, and do a currency adjustment for the Big Mac to, to compare it with the United States and everyone else in the world, like Switzerland, all the way into Australia. Now, if you take a look at the fast food, and this is a link, by the way, that I provided you if you want to look at it. It's called a Fairworth Obmansman. If you're part-time and you're age 16, and you're working at a fast food, uh, you get 11.69. Now, the, the, this is in, I apologize, this is in, uh, in uh, uh, Australian dollar. Yeah, but it's worth uh, 70 cents to the one dollar. So just subtract that. And I actually have it here. So you can see that as you get older, somewhere I have it, or I did, lost it. It's okay, we can use the. Okay, you use your 0.7 calculator, I think. So you can see at age 16, it's 11.69 Australian, uh, 14.03, uh, uh, 17, all the way up to age 20. It's twenty-one dollars. That's equivalent to about sixteen, seventeen bucks an hour if you're age twenty-one. The big hmm? is this just in the fast food industry? No, no, it's a entirely. They have a what they call an ombudsman. The example I'm using here is the Big Mac Index. Okay, and I'm going to tie it into the fact that the Economist magazine puts out a thing, you know, and that's an economist, and what they do is they currency adjust the price of the Big Mac. And, and by the way, whenever, who, who raised their hand? Who went to McDonald's? Yeah. And, the, and it is, it tastes the same. Just like Budweiser beer, if you go to New York, it tastes the same as the one in California, but they use a different method to make sure it tastes the same. But the quality is the same. And I take pictures, and I had, I, every city we went, I'd always take pictures of the menu of the Big Mac, just to compare it. And in this, uh, The Economist magazine I pointed out that Australia, now you would think with this graduated minimum wage, and by the way, the average uh, fast uh, food uh, worker in the United States is 30. Right? In Australia, the Big Mac is 4%, 4.6% cheaper than in the United States, currency adjusted. So what's the difference? Well, first of all, I have to transport all that food, and then the difference is the, the building and, and, the, and the labor, okay? So really, <clears throat> From that experience, whenever I hear, well, if you raise the minimum wage from $7.25 in Idaho, it'll be a $10 Big Mac. Well, that's all I can say about that. Now, a lot of people don't, don't know that, and there's no evidence of proof, but here's, here's some evidence. So when I, when I heard that they had a graduated minimum wage, I did my homework, and this is where you can find it. Uh, Switzerland is <laughs> 35% higher. 
But there's only four other countries in that index that's higher than the United States. Switzerland, man, they want a lot for everything. How many have been to Switzerland? Okay, what are the prices? <laughs> have you seen? It was so long ago, I don't know. Oh, remember. okay. And, uh, they probably didn't even have them. Because I, we were there uh, last summer, and uh, prices in Switzerland are very expensive. Yeah. Well, yeah. So take a look at the Big Mac Index and prove it to yourself. That's why I gave you the link. Okay. <clears throat> I told you the story about how I discovered when we were, I think it was 2004, with this family from India that was actually, I mean, his heritage was India, but he lived in Australia, and he said he had a Medicare card. And I'll show you that card here. Here again, I didn't know how this was going to work out, but now I know. There it is. There it is. Medicare, and it's not for 65 year olds, it's for everybody. So, and it says your social security number is no longer used for Medicare, okay? So nobody gets a bill down there. And as far as elective surgery is concerned, it's just like here. I'm a disabled American veteran, and I got 10% here in 10%. <clears throat> and you gotta wait sometimes, okay? And unless you're in a dire strait, when the VA says, we'll get you to the local hospital where they'll charge you a lot. Well, but don't worry about a thing because we'll cover the bill. But they, they did this, and they did this years ago. <clears throat> and we're the only country, uh, for example, another thing is, <clears throat> I found out in New Zealand they advertise drugs on TV. And there's only one other country that allows that. <laughs> the uh, United States. Other countries do not allow drug advertisement on television. I hate watching this thing because, you know, it's just constant drugs. And then when they say, you're, you're gonna bleed inside, you're, you're gonna have hair grown somewhere, you know, your teeth are gonna fall out. I mean, why? But the thing is that that adds, adds to the expense of, of uh, uh, drugs. And a lot of times if uh, somebody will say, well, I'm sick, they go to their doctor and say, hey, I saw this on TV. It's kind of like the ad that says, it's seen on TV. <laughs> you can imagine the frustration for a doctor. And then also uh, in Rochester, uh, IBM transferred me to Rochester, Minnesota. And I became very familiar with the Mayo Clinic. And they, they're not, the, all their doctors are salaried. One million people come to Rochester, Minnesota, the, the Mayo Clinic every year from all over the world. King of Jordan, and this one guy brought his 10 wives with him. Went to the house and they clogged up the septic tank. <laughs> but, but anyway, if you if you have something, if I ever have anything that they can't diagnose locally, that's where I'm headed. Her dad, uh, back in the 70s, had he couldn't swallow. He's a, he was a disabled American veteran, uh, both uh, uh, World War II and Korea. He went to the Mayo Clinic for 1,500 bucks. They put him through a regimen. In six days, they told him he had a hiatal hernia, and they couldn't diagnose it in Pocatello. So anyway, that's my other pitch. I, I'm not paid for this advertisement, <laughs> but, but the doctors are in fact uh, are salary, so they don't have any incentive to charge more. Okay, uh, here again, there's uh, different ways you can go out and look, and I, and I provide the, uh, the link to this if you take a look, cheap, uh, uh, it's called AHM, I assume that's uh, Australian Health Management. So just Google uh, healthcare in Australia, and it'll, it'll bring up all the rules, including uh, Medicare and what you have to do and how, to, how you get treatment. And there's another <coughs> film that, uh, that's... Well, so who pays for it? Well, it's, it's all uh, tax money. It's income tax. With the taxes rising. I don't know that. All I know is, and like, in, like in Canada, for example, they come down here and I've met them. <laughs> I've met them with uh, snowbirds in the Yuma. And I talk to the, the, the Canadians, and I say, well, how's your health care? We're just hoping that the United States health care doesn't migrate to Canada. But as it is, and you're gonna hear all kinds of stories, and when it comes to health care, in my opinion, um, it, 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 it's not perfect, you're sick. And, and, it, and your body gives out, and all this kind of stuff. Nobody's happy. Doctors are not miracle workers, they're people. 
but the thing is, it costs us a hell of a lot of money in this country. There's, uh, what is it, 600,000 people that declare medical bankruptcy in this country every year. Now, that's not a political statement. That's a fact. And in fact, the, you know, different thing. But I won't go into all the details. But all I'm saying is they're very happy down there in other countries. There's a video that I've watched. It's put out about eight years ago by a Washington Post reporter. And you can Google this. And the front line is called Sick Around the World. This is where a Washington reporter, how am I doing? <laughs> Went around the world and uh, he visited uh, five other countries like uh, Taiwan, uh, Great Britain, Germany, and, and he asked the same question to all of them. How many people, anybody in Japan? He said, how many people in your country go bankrupt for medical bills? The guy said, nobody. <laughs> you scandal. So anyway, the, you know, we're seniors and we've got Medicare. But what about our kids and grandkids? Right? And all you have to do is lose a job and that sort of thing. They, IBM just discontinued my health care. I'm a retiree from IBM of 32 years. If I didn't go on Medicare Advantage, they said, well, I'm sorry. We're not going to reimburse a lot of your insurance expenses and about $3,000 a year. So I gave it up. They just cut it. And I'm not going on it because that's a private health care system. It's not Medicare. But that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's do I'll finish up with the compulsory voting. And, and what they had happen in Australia was uh, back in 1924, you know, have you, how many of you know Australians? Or have you, yeah, what are they like? They're great. <laughs> no, they're great. They'll be a little bit uh, uh, trying to tie me down a sport. And all that, you know. They're pretty independent people. Well, anyway, when they had the elections, only uh, about 48% turned out or 24%. And every time the politicians would come out, how are you doing? You guys are a bunch of crooks. <laughs> and they got tired of it. The, the, uh, the government got tired of it. The people that were elected got tired of it. We're going to fix you. <laughs> and so what they did is they made uh, Australia so you have to vote. You have to show up at the polls. And as a result of that, they've got a 94% turnout. If you don't show up, they will send you a bill. You owe us 25 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and this, uh, in, since 1924, and uh, we had uh, one of the tour, tour groups uh, when we were in, I don't know, or Rotorua or someplace. Uh, he said, yeah, they sent me a bill from 150 bucks. <laughs> so they're very, and, and they follow up. There's 18 countries that will, in fact, uh, follow up and, and send them a bill because you've got to show up at the polling place and you've got to sign the book. You don't have to vote, but you've got to show up. And so as a result of that, they're kind of happy a little bit. And they don't like taxes like us and everybody else, but on the other hand, think about it. They've got universal health care, they've got a graduated minimum wage. It seems to work in other things. And I've talked to the Aussies. I call them Aussies on my ham radio, and they're very fun to talk to. Alice Springs, they have a good book. I wouldn't go to Alice Springs. <laughs> There's nothing there. You know, it's pretty desolate. Now, Australia is about three quarters of uh, the desert, kind of like Arizona. But uh, and, uh, from what I can tell, everything is on the East Coast and going to the Barrier Reef and, and that sort of thing. And uh, same thing in Northern Ireland, New Zealand. So anyway, um, 18 other countries have compulsory voting. 10 don't enforce it, but 18 do enforce it. And uh, hey, it works. You know, and, and, we, and we've got in Idaho, and I ran for office, I run in office, in Idaho, we have 250,000 people that are eligible to vote in Idaho that are not registered to vote. So not even registered. Not even registered to vote. And I met them. Well, my vote doesn't count. <laughs> you know? And, and for some reason, they're convinced that their vote doesn't count. Well, uh, it will. But you got to participate because that's the key to democracy. Okay. Now I'm ready. Any questions? Or any other questions? Is there something I said that, that, that is not, that you'd like to, am I in the question and answer period? Mm -hmm. Okay. Did I make it okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay. I promise I'd keep an eye on the clock. And my friend said, don't be too, too gabby. Very.
did you have a favorite place or did you love it all? We're getting ready to go in, in April. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, we're, we're not scuba divers, okay, because uh, stuff. And then she's handicapped, but uh, what would you say, hon? Fiji. We, the, the one I had the most fun at was they took us to like a zoo uh -huh. and you can hold the koalas. Oh. You can pet the joeys. You can um, hear the, the kookaburras. Mm -hmm. You can go into and see the, I think it's the parrots or the birds, all kinds of different colors. Just absolutely wonderful. Then we got to go see the um, alligators, mm -hmm. crocodiles, what's ever there. Mm -hmm. They are, in real life, <laughs> they are humongous. <laughs> So I bought a little souvenir like this one that I keep, so I know. But for me, that was it. They had a big spider. I'd never seen a spider this big. You know? So they have different kind of bugs down there. Yes, sir. Um, how are the Aborigines or Native Australians doing? Are they incorporated in? Oh, yeah. OK. I'm glad you brought that up, and I forgot to mention this. In New Zealand, when we were at uh, Rotorua, and they, and they gave a talk, New Zealand has the longest treaty with the indigenous people, the Amores, or probably the Amores. Amores, and the English, since 17-something or other. And their treaty is written on the, on the back of a, uh, uh, a goat skin, or a sheep. It's there. It's in force. And so how do they accomplish that? Shut up. <laughs> how do they accomplish that? Thank you. <laughs> so how do they accomplish that? They allowed intermarriage between the indigenous and the English. Okay? And that was it. There was no segregation. If a, if a woman from the New Zealand a native wanted to marry an English guy, okay, same thing, okay. Now, as far as the Aborigines are concerned, uh, they're, they're blacks, and you can read about things, but uh, they're, everybody's respectful down there. And of course, it's, you know, like Idaho's dominated with 90% white. We only have 1% blacks here, but, you know, sometimes we think white is, is it, you know. I'm white, but I've been around the world, and I was, you can't imagine in China being the only guy with got a big nose. <laughs> and tall. And tall. And uh, when we were at the Great Wall, Rochelle was sitting there because she didn't want to go up and I was coming down and a lady came over and started playing with her hair. Because she'd never seen red hair. So I hope I answered your question. You know, really, there, it's like everything else. You know, when I was living in Augusta, Georgia, it was wrong what we did, what this country did. And that segregation of schools. I went to an all-white school, and they integrated it in 1968 after I graduated, or 69. And I saw racism. I saw, and a lot of these guys with a Confederate, I never saw a Confederate flag in Augusta, Georgia, where I was. The only place I saw them was out there in the, in the Thule's, uh, where uh, poor farmers live. And, and, uh, but anyway, I think the world's changing, and we have to change with it. We got to get rid of this stuff and a lot of people are teaching their kids racism inside their homes you got to move on i think my opinion in defense of the south which mm -hmm. i was raised down there where at uh, it happens everywhere I know, racism is everywhere i know that but yeah. it's taught at home of course yeah that's D decades ago weren't the, the aborigines in australia Segregated to like severe. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, sure. Excuse me, but my colleague here is that way. Yeah, well, it's, but the thing is, uh, through education, through education, when we desegregated the school, better Barack Obama. Okay? Uh, I mean, come on. It's, through uh, education, that all went away. Kids, kids don't look at things like that unless they're taught at home. So, did Australia? Um, modernize about the same time the U.S. did? Oh, yeah. And They're our buddies. They really them. like us. Oh, no, they really do. They're worried about us. But they, they like us. Maybe they're ahead of us. 
well, obviously ahead of us, yeah. universal health care, graduated minimum wage, no ten dollar big Macs. You know, we have a lot of lying going on here. I think my opinion. Did you tell them about Fiji and the, the lady that we met that was six foot, seven okay, foot tall? Okay, final thing I'll do, and since there's no questions, in the Fiji Islands, and this is where you learn about the culture. You ever heard of Kava? Mm -hmm. It's booze. It's a local booze. But anyway, they have a, uh, in, the, in the village, they explained there was this gal that was like six foot nine, you know? In a village, the, the chill, the, uh, everything that you own in your village, if you have a TV, a big screen TV, and if you got a little TV, you go over and watch the ball game, can just open the door, sit down, and watch TV while they're eating. Everything everybody has in that village, everybody owns, has access to. Do you have a car? Need a ride? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, here, here, okay. And that's the culture thing. Is that what you're talking about? <clears throat> So, you know, we, we seem to think that we're only game in town, but uh, when you do this and you've traveled, I, I think a lot of you have traveled. But this, this uh, Grand Circle Tour group is an excellent group if you ever want to. We did 10 flights. We'd go from one city, stay over, do our, do our touring. We had to have our bags packed outside the door, ready for them to pick up. We had to be down to be on the bus, and then to the plane. And then the, 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 the next destination, it was like to another place. So in those 22 days, was it? Or however long, we had 10 flights. And the reason was so that was back is the original schedule was to go to Christchurch, but they had that earthquake. So they made arrangements, no extra cost to go to all these other places. Part of it. Instead of going to Christchurch, we went to Rotary. Well, thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> One more. Why does Little leave on an interesting one? Uh, did people talk to you about their opinions of firearms policies? And <laughs> they took care of business. They don't have any mass killings. Um, we have, uh, at the present time, we have mass killings because of, and I'm a veteran. And so they have no concerns as far as, uh, they all have guns. They, they are, they're hunters. So as far as uh, what's going on here, a lot of them don't understand. Okay, my Switzerland has more guns per population uh, than the United States, but they've had no mass shootings since 2001. Anyway, thank you. My group is presenting on Finland, Estonia, and Russia on March 8th. And a uh, ham radio repeater in the Teton Dam on March 22nd. Thank you for coming. Drive safely. <laughs> That's right. Is my picture floating around here somewhere? Yeah. It's right. Oh, okay. That's good. I wanted to ask you, with the work that you do in the last did you know any of those things? No. I was only there tonight. I was thrown in jail. I didn't do it. <laughs> Oh, okay. There were three families in Swap. Yeah, and uh, when his family got in, when he sent me a picture of in Germany, he was consular to Finland with a big crest. I said, you got to be kidding me. This guy was crazy. But he spoke, he spoke five languages. Yeah, I was there nine months, and that's why my dad said, I had too much rum and coke on my dress. <laughs>
Would talk to you. Yeah. And you're going, <laughs> who's talking to you? I know. I have a friend and I have a She has three uh, tropical birds, and the parrot is really pretty. And he he can talk a little bit, then she has two other ones. Uh -huh. And they're all in big cages in her living room, and they're all friends together and everything. Yeah. yeah. They live a long time. Years yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, they do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the, but and then the crocodiles. Oh my! Like, did they get tame? They're they're in the they're in the water, oh. and you can at the visitor center where we were at. You can go out and look at them. And they'll come right up and then they'll just open their mouth. And, oh, and so they are tame. And and you're looking at the mic. Like, I'm not feeding you today. I know. I'm not. <laughs> I know, because I think they can swallow things whole almost. And they'll just back down, and all you can see is these eyes sticking out. And it's oh. scary. Oh. So you need to know what you're doing around. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Because, like, you could, I don't know, probably drop something and go to pick it up if it's too close to the water. You probably wouldn't have a hand. I know. Oh, yeah. And little kids and dogs and stuff, you so I bought me a little one. It's about this big. Uh -huh. So I move it from room to room. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, so here are these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You watch 